You're watching Beyond Markets. Welcome, I am Wale Famarewa. On the program today, we'll discuss how Nigeria can reposition itself as the telecom's investment destination. As always, you can join the conversation by following us on Twitter. The hashtag is Beyond Markets, and you can follow me at Wale Famarewa. Now, although Nigeria's telecom space has been a nest of activities in the recent months, the sector grew by 11.5% in the second quarter of the year. So what are the investment opportunities in the sector and how can Nigeria reposition itself as a telecoms investment destination? Olushola Teniola, the president of the Association of Telecoms Companies of Nigeria, joins us for this discussion. Thanks so much, Shola, for joining us today. Um, so thank you very much for having me. Before we get into the broad details of the sector, I just want to also come back to the issue about MTN because you really can't run away from that. It's, it's an issue that is it's really beyond telecoms. It's all about investments. I was speaking to a trader recently, and they were more or less suggesting that there are some portfolio investors who are now reconsidering coming to Nigeria because they don't quite understand the issues around the certificate of capital importation and how that could be such a big issue. And the central bank is asking that MTN um, returns monies that has repatriated over the years. So let's first of all get your perspective on how this is playing out and how significant it is for investment flows into Nigeria. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, uncertainty is the big thing here. Um, investors do not know how to handle or quantify or qualify uncertainty. So if you create a certainty in policies, in directives, yeah. and in actions, then you'll find that investors feel that there is a stable environment to put in further investments into uh, an economy. So what we're dealing with really is uncertainty. Yeah. Which way is this going to go? Which scenario is going to play out? And it came as a surprise. You know, timing is a big thing as well, because if you look at how the issue around repartitions came out, there were discussions ongoing before the news broke out. And the way the information was uh, sanitized and sensitized in the social media didn't help, help things as well. So it's management of sensitive information as well that caused some level of concern and nervousness that maybe the CCIs that were issued over a period, not only to MTN but to others, are they genuine? Is there any irregularities around it? So one has to be cautious in the way we treat information. I think that yes, fake news is there. However, fake news is not about social media. Fake news has been around way before social media. So the idea is that uh, a regulator especially a very important regulator, has to ensure that information that is brought out is concise and robust enough to ensure that investors do not panic. And any information that's released from the likes of the CBN has to be rechecked, double-checked, and confirmed yeah. before it's released. So it's really a ripple effect. So the CBN issue with MTN as we've been rightly uh, informed, there's an ongoing dialogue. Yeah. That dialogue should have happened before. You know, there's further information released by MTN where that information was there before. So, you know, before actions are made, regulators should have the full information before they make a decision. Secondly, then when I say about timing, the AGF then stepped in. The Which attorney, is the unusual, attorney, right? uh, for an attorney general, it is unusual. You would have thought that FRS, the customs, Should be the because it's a tax issue. issue like so that, yes. then MTN said they had given information to the AGF suggesting a figure. AGF comes back with a figure north of that figure. Where did the difference come from? Because you are talking about a company that submits audited accounts. Yeah. So that causes uncertainty and fair in some in quarters that we have potentially investments that uh, are running through our vehicle that is CAC registered, submitted accounts, and they could be questioned, not even by FRS or customs, but the AGF. So that causes uncertainty and we really have to look at how we regulate uh, not only the telecoms industry, but the wider other sectors that are obviously under the oversight of um, CCIs, for instance. Well, of course, the central bank has put out a statement uh, recently, and 
A part of it says we assure all investors that the integrity of the CCI remains sacrosanct and there shall be no retroactive application of foreign exchange rules and regulations. And they end that with a statement saying the central bank welcomes all legitimate investors to take advantage of the enormous investment opportunities in Nigeria. So to some extent, a way to placate investors who are concerned about what is going on right now. Um, the optics obviously are not great because you've made a point about the, uh, the, the fact that it's really unusual that the AGF is the one stepping in on a case that you would expect that the FIRS should handle. And I've spoken to quite a few um, of the banks involved and you know, some are suggesting that even though, yes, from all indications, there, there are some questions about how um, the, the, the movement of the money was managed, that at the end of the day, it, it's not a case where you ask the investor to bring back the money. I think at the end of the day, you, you probably find one or two people and the, the issue is dealt with. But let's, let's move on and um, get your perspective on the investment opportunity that still sits in this market. Um, we, we, we'll be talking a bit more about Nine Mobile and its, its future. Mm. Um, obviously, there are some investors that are looking at it. But what are the prospects for, for this market? What's the next phase of growth, if you like, for telecoms? If you look at uh, the way the industry is structured, we have four major MNOs. Nine Mobile is one of them. But really, Nine Mobile is trailing way behind the leaders, of the, the three, that uh, in terms of subscriber numbers. Sure. Uh, and remember that this is a volume business now. We're not talking about um, other players that equally have an importance to contribute to the growth of the economy. However, they are sub maybe a million subscribers. So anyone above a million subscribers has done well in this very dynamic industry because we have major players and we have those that uh, uh, contribute to the ecosystem. What we have right now is a situation where price is the main determinant in, our, in the market. And yes, the regulator NCC is trying to ensure that there is a competitive and fair playing field. However, the consumers demand lower pricing, not only on voice, but on data, because CPI and the consumer spending power has decreased and we are just coming out of a recession. So those are the realities of what we see as is. Going forward, we need to be able to control costs. So opportunities around how we can improve on our costing of delivery of services to not only the urban cities, because remember, 4G is the darling on the street at the moment. 4G in uh, our industry means higher speed broadband on literally what was a voice network, GSM. But we have a prevalence of 2G networks in Nigeria. So most of the operators are obviously sweating the assets on the 2G, rightly so, because there isn't a demand case in the rural areas for an improvement on the network to increase it to 4G, for instance. Mm. And 3G has been very patchy. So there's an opportunity now to increase the deployment of 4G in the urban cities, increase the use cases around that, and I mean African use cases, that ensures that there's an additional revenue stream for the current operators, because it can't just be about pricing. Because as we see at the moment, upper rates are on average about $4 uh, per subscriber per month. And if you, even if you're doing volumes of millions of subscribers, you can see that that's tailing off your revenue line. So it's beholden to anyone who's coming into this game to ensure that, yes, they increase their subscriber base number, but they actually introduce products and services that differentiate them to bring in new uh, revenues. But, but where is the opportunity for adding, if you like, value-added services um, as another... Um, growth mm -hmm. opportunity in the market. Yeah. How, how do you see that playing out, especially with all that's happening with uh, new technology around media? Let's uh, step back a bit. Um, telecoms is about connectivity. It's boring. But it's, it's profitable if you get the economics right. It's a numbers game. Purely numbers game. It's a bit like oil and gas actually, but it's harder and a bit more complex. 
So the idea is that you want to be able to create a market, a market that consumers haven't thought of and feel that they cannot do without. So voice is a good example. We all like to communicate. So before the advent of GSM introduction into Nigeria, we used to queue, or some of us used to queue. You wouldn't walk 200, 300, 500, 800 kilometers to get to a phone. In the olden days, you would just send a, a letter. GSM has changed that. Now you can pick up your phone. So it introduces you to services you never thought of. Now, but the basic necessity was to make a voice call. Yeah. So now you talk about value-added services. There's several permutations and combinations of services you can deliver. Some of them are irrelevant to what we need. But you might get one or two or maybe ten that are relevant, and that's about innovation. So the value-added services that we have in Nigeria are opportunistic in, in, in certain cases. It's one person starts and it's almost a herd, herd, herd mentality. So what we need to do is step back and look at essentially what are the value-added services that are relevant to the Nigerian terrain. We're good with music. We're good with Nollywood. So that suggests content. But content is in the purview of the, of the inventor, you know, and how does intellectual property, how are they secured? What are your digital rights? So there's areas in that ecosystem that needs to be built from a demand side. And then the network operators only really are there to facilitate the delivery of that mm. content on the back of their voice infrastructure. So the opportunities for anyone coming to Nigeria is that we need to build that ecosystem, that digital ecosystem that has transformed what is our culture into a digital form and then enable the delivery. But on, that, on the aspect of improving the network, I focused on 4G. Why? Because the devices that we have, the smart devices, are really tailored for 4G or even higher speeds. That's if you have a smartphone. Yeah. And there's opportunities now, and I've recently heard that there's a, a, an, an operator uh, that actually has deployed an OEM that can make a feature phone almost like a smartphone. So that's an opportunity for that type of technology to enter the rural areas where the price of a smartphone is beyond the average uh, uh, person or yeah. average Nigerian. Uh, just hold that thought. We'll come back after this. I have to take a short break. I've been speaking to Olusha Latinella, the president of the Association of Telecom Op Operators of Nigeria. If you're just joining us, we are looking at how Nigeria can reposition itself as a telecoms investment destination. Stay with me for this discussion is Olushola Teniola, the president of the Association of Telecom Companies of Nigeria. I'm um, sure let's continue that conversation around um, value added services. Because I, I do get an opportunity that, as we've seen with a lot of disruption with fintech, there is a disruption that potentially could come into telecoms. And that disruption, I think, is something that's going to give traditional um, video media a run for its money. Because the, the great thing about telecoms is that they, they're reaching so many people. And with the technology that smartphone offers right now, it's all a question of finding a way to make sure that people can simply look on their phone and consume all that content. How close do you think we are to, to that? And what, what, in your view, will be the hindrance that will stop that from happening? It's whether we have the appetite and whether there is a player that will take the first lead. Let's look at what's happening in East Africa, in Kenya, for instance. Uh, Safaricom and m is a good example. I mean, you know, that technology had already been tested in uh, Singapore, I believe, or in Malaysia, uh, twice, and, and in Japan, in fact, and it didn't quite get uh, reception that is gotten in um, Kenya. So that's a good example. It took the lead, and it's uh, now a template being used in other countries. Mm. So you talk about fintech, you talk about e this or mobile m this that. They're, they're ready. I'm, I'm you know I'm really not so much uh, tripped no, I, by I'm what moving away from the that. technology so we've can seen... do. They, they, it's, they're ready there. So what we need to do uh, as uh, an industry is to collaborate with those that have the content. Right. And. That so discussion, that's music and video content. Yes, as a start, because that's our strength. Those are low-hanging fruits. If you look at Africa 
and the way Nollywood now is penetrating outside Africa, that's currency. That's intellectual property that can be sold, and it's a revenue earner for us. It's another, another diversification, diversification strategy for the government. And that's real. So we now need to build an ecosystem, a structure around that. We don't have that. It's, it's, you say that uh, the value-added services, it's not the only way. No, it isn't the only way. It's one way to, to actually gain access to foreign revenue. So what I uh, would advocate is that there is a collaboration in between the music industry, the Nollywoods, and the telco service providers so that the average person in the streets has an, has an alternative way of digesting the content, and that's through the device. Yeah. You know, we have 160 million active subscribers, and basically, other than them sending USSD codes and making phone calls and maybe using WhatsApp if they have the platform to do it, that's what they're doing. So they're not actually util fully utilizing the device that they have in their hands, and I'm suggesting that that can be built and we can leverage much more uh, so that we have an opportunity to actually grow the market beyond what it's actually doing, which is just literally the Villena services. Yeah. All right. If we can speak briefly around main one, of course, that's the undersea cable provider. Yes. Um, essentially, one of those that are providing broadband to this part of the country. They've done a deal with Orange uh, recently, and that's taking that service all the way to Senegal and Cote d'Ivoire. How significant do you think that is, and what, what, what does that mean in terms of the growth of, of, of the providers of such cables? Do you know that uh, May One, Nigerian company, obviously uh, registered in Mauritius, um, has always had the ambition to improve the lives of uh, the average Nigerian. So the cable that they landed in July uh, 2010 was the beginning of that journey. They've also want to extend those offerings to the ECOWAS countries. And they are also an ATCON member. So the lessons they've learned about dropping a cable on the shores of Lagos and then trying to get that capacity into the country is the same challenges that these countries, I believe they've signed now with um, Orange and uh, that gives them the capacity to now drop in Dakar, Senegal, and um, Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire. So it opens up that market, potentially. Now the difference in between those two countries I've mentioned and Nigeria is that they have a form of a national backbone network. Right. So it's almost plug and play for them. Mm. We're doing the reverse. We have. The, the cable sitting, and we have five of them, but we have no national backbone network. Let's talk about that, that backbone. How do we crack that in Nigeria? Um, it seems that someone has to take the first, that major investment. Um, how do you see us moving ahead on that? Because it, it really provides an infrastructure that you can add so much on. Yes. Now, everything you said before, value-added services, this, value-added service, that, yeah. the presumption was that it's wireless delivery. It isn't. It's it's huge capacity, requires bandwidth, and you can really, really get that through fiber network. I mean, it's, 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 it's where everyone's going. So we have an opportunity to leapfrog the other countries that have a legacy network, which is predominated on copper. So what Ming Wan has done is that they have to seek revenue from these two countries that I've just mentioned. In Nigeria's case, with the lack of a national backbone network, which is what I mean by that is a humongous national backbone network, is due to the fact that the way we have licensed um, the MNOs was to give them the ability to build their own backbone network. Because when they came, there wasn't power. Mm. And the NITEL of then couldn't provide them with that facility. So we have islands of duplicated fiber networks, right. and we need to move away from that. So is, so active is, this, sharing, is this a call that the NCC has to make? It uh, is a call that the regulator has to make because over the years, the operators haven't found a way to 
collaborate on or partner on doing it on their own. So they need a tool and they need a directive to ensure that that happens because you can't be spending capex, which is getting harder to get, by the way. I mean, it's <laughs> funded capital is getting much harder um, to duplicate infrastructure that can be shared. Right. Uh, and that's the model that you'll find in Dakar, sorry, in Senegal, and mm. in Cote d'Ivoire, mm. that there is a um, national bank network that people are sharing. Okay, let's talk a bit about regulation, though. How will you assess regulation in Nigeria? Is it, if you like, investor-friendly? Are there issues that you're seeing that um, might stifle investment flows into the country? Do the uh, regulators need to be a little more... Uh, friendly to investors in terms of how they're putting out their regulations. Mm. If you look at our industry, we're battling with uh, 38 taxes and maybe a 39th levy. So that makes it a very heavily uh, overtaxed and overregulated industry. Mm. So the example that has come out of the recent uh, issue surrounding CCIs is an interesting one because obviously over the years, uh, the investment community and anyone in the telcos uh, assumes that we are regulated by NCC. But it seems like we now have an oversight by CBN. And others, to the extent that you have to export your capital. That's Forex, though. Yeah. Those who don't deal with Forex then shouldn't be regulated. And unfortunately, in Nigeria, we're an import-dependent economy. And in our sector, everything. We're not going to build telecoms equipment in Nigeria overnight and then export them. We have to import them. So that's the reality. It is equipment that we need. So uh, there's a dependence there, but it should be that NCC and CBN have an understanding and on how certain areas of a corporate is uh, regulated. Um, so until we get some clarity and there's some harmonization, especially on the tax issue, harmonization, then you will find that investors will be rather cautious and the type of investment that might come may not be the sort of investment we, we need. You know, you know, if you chase away the good ones, you get the bad ones uh, because there's good and bad investment. And in Nigeria might be a destination for bad investments if we continue the way we are treating the good investors. I think as we begin to wrap, I think there's a, a, a very important point I think I would like us to, to really touch it. And that is taking a look at the telecoms industry as an industry that can actually drive economic growth and activity. Because we've spoken about value added services. And if we can have the backbone working as it should be, then we can add so many m more industries. And then there are, there are Industries like the entertainment sector that can be plugged in and that can drive another uh, um, level of growth for those. So it's really a case of rethinking the telecommunications industry and trying to see the same way we're looking at agriculture as an opportunity to create jobs and to drive economic growth. We can potentially look at the telecoms industry as a more um, recent industry, but certainly with tremendous potential as well. I think we have no choice. I read, you know, I heard you make that statement. Uh, telecoms is a critical part of any nation. You just go around, and I, I, I really am concerned that government hasn't really picked that up. Mm. When telecoms is an enabler, I mean, there's no way you are going to fit into the digital world, and that's where the world is moving to. I mean, we don't define it, we just embrace it without fully, government fully embracing it and actually taking the lead. If you don't have a strong telecoms industry, you cannot do a fraction of what you <laughs> have just stated. Right. And it would just be on pa pieces of paper. I'll be fairly honest with you. I think that we have a lot of catching up to do. I think that the regulation we have is somewhat outdated. Uh, it speaks to the voice era. And the world is talking data era. It's moved, yeah. and what concerns me is that even our educational system has, is devoid of the future, devoid of the future. And that's a big shout to anyone who's listening to this program that yeah. we need to invest in appropriate curricula that allows the younger generation to be part of the future. Thank you so much for coming in this 
um, today and sharing your perspective. Olushala Teniola is the president of the Association of Telecom Companies of Nigeria. And that's it on Beyond Markets. Thank you for being part of it. Remember, you can watch all previous episodes of the program on our website, cnbcafrica.com. And stay engaged with the hashtag Beyond Markets and follow me on Twitter at Wale Famrewa. Thank you for watching and have a great evening. Thank you.